I've forgotten now how many years it is that I've been coming here, I guess five, four. And, huh? Five, six, seven, eight. And each time, it was a great pleasure because so many here have been making a very serious effort to break down the barrier of language to understand this message of the infinite way. It isn't a, an easy message to understand even if English were your native language. We have many in the United States and Canada and England who find it very, very difficult to grasp the meaning of this message. And uh, breaking this barrier of the language can be even more difficult. <clears throat> Except for one thing, that if you can catch the simplicity of the message, then language is no barrier, and even a very, very simple or very slight knowledge of the language will give you the entire secret. The message is difficult not because of being complex. It is difficult because of its simplicity. That is what makes the entire message of the infinite way difficult. It is its very simplicity. You see, <clears throat> it is not an involved teaching. There are not many principles or deep metaphysics to this message. On the contrary, we begin with probably the most simple thing to understand in all religion, and that is this. There must be a God experience. In other words, religion is not of the mind. It is of the heart. It is of the soul. There are no deep principles in a true spiritual message. That is why Jesus Christ could say that we must come as little children, not seeking the deep things, the mysterious things of life, but the simple things. Now, the most simple of all to understand is this, that if you knew all of the Bibles of the world, every Bible, every scripture, and if you knew all of the philosophies of the world and all of the metaphysics of the world, it might not help you to be healed of a simple headache. It might not help you to attain one minute of peace or happiness on earth. Because there is only one lasting satisfaction in life. Without this, everything else becomes dust. Fame, wealth, society, none of these count. None of these make for happiness or for health or for contentment. Yes, it is wonderful to have health, 
and it's wonderful to have wealth if along with those things we have this one needful thing and that is the experience of God to be able to go within to go within yourself or myself and there find the kingdom of God and experience it have actual communion with God this really is worthwhile this makes health a joyous matter this makes wealth a joyous matter this even makes fame a joyous matter if together with these things we have God not God as a word in a book not God as a teaching God as an experience and that is where this entire message of the infinite way began to you who have not heard me before or who are not yet familiar with all of this message let me tell you that it had its beginning in just a businessman wanting to know if there wasn't something more in life than just a successful business and good times and sufficient money I was that businessman that had many things good things that this world has to offer but did not have the real thing and therefore did not have contentment or peace or satisfaction or even the right sense of health and so it was that this search led up to a date the end of 1928 when that most longed for thing happened a God experience a spiritual experience I didn't recognize it as that at first I didn't understand it at first I only knew that whereas before I enjoyed my business I no longer enjoyed it whereas before I enjoyed the theater and the dances and the things of the world I no longer enjoyed them and uh, neither did they enter my mind I didn't miss them I didn't enjoy them I didn't want them but neither did I think about them they disappeared from my experience from my thoughts and then the second thing that I noticed was that first a woman came to me a businesswoman and asked me to pray with her and told me that if I would pray with her she could get well and of course I knew nothing about prayer and I didn't know how to answer her but I did the best I could I closed my eyes and turned to God and I received an answer the first time that I was ever aware that God spoke to men I heard a voice within me say man cannot heal and I just rested and that woman was healed and a couple of days later a man asked me if I would pray with him that he was sick and in pain I still didn't know how to pray but I could close my eyes again and wait while I was waiting he said my pain is gone and that went on for 18 months and at the end of the 18 months so many people were asking for healings that I had no more time for business and I left the business world and I haven't been back in it since now that was how I learned that it isn't what you know that makes your life healthy wealthy or wise it isn't whether or not you know how to pray it isn't whether or not you give up pleading with God and begin affirming 
It has nothing to do with that at all. It has to do with whether or not we actually make contact with that spirit that is within each one of us and which is very difficult to contact very difficult the average person has great difficulty in attaining that ability by themselves and if they find somebody in the relationship of practitioner or teacher who is sufficiently one with God that one then makes it possible for thousands of others to attain their conscious union with God. At first, this was a very <clears throat> difficult situation for me because I did have that knack or gift of healing but no understanding of how it took place. And that's very difficult when people come to you and want to know. And then, of course, I began the study of what had been discovered by others. I studied all of Mrs. Eddy's writings in Christian science. I studied many other things that are written in books. But I did not find the answer to the actual principle that was involved until more of these experiences began to come to me, these spiritual experiences. And then I learned what in our work in the infinite way is probably the most important part. And that is this. There is no such thing as God answering prayer in the way that men usually expect. In other words, you cannot pray to God for something and get it. Oh, there are a few experiences in life which seem to contradict that but if you could examine each one of them, you would find that it is literally true that God does not give us the things we pray for, and God cannot. It is for this reason that James said, if you pray and do not receive your answer, it is because you pray amiss. Now let us be honest at least with each other. The world has been praying so far as recorded history is concerned for five or seven thousand years. Praying for peace on earth. And it hasn't come yet. They've been praying to God for health. It hasn't come yet. They're praying to God for happiness, for supply, for abundance. It hasn't come yet. Not as a result of prayer. Oh no, the world that is praying to God for health, for abundance, for peace on earth, I'm afraid they will go on praying for the next 10,000 years without getting any answers. Just as our ancestors have been praying these thousands of years and uh, if you'll notice we spend more for armament now each year than has been spent in the last 2,000 years put together so there's been no answer for peace on earth and I'm sure that if you would count up the amount of dollars spent on medicine each year you would find out that more is spent for medicine and medication and hospitalization than probably was spent in 3,000 years all added up together. So you can't say that disease is lessening because of prayer. And if you'll just glance around the world at the poverty that's in this world, 
you'll acknowledge that prayer has not removed poverty from the earth. Not poverty, not disease, and not war. And those have been the three main things that people have been praying for all of these thousands of years. And the answer is, they pray amiss. Not poverty, not the mysterious things of life, but the simple things. And when this begins to happen, our salvation has taken place. From then on, we are renewed day by day. From then on, those lost years of the locusts are restored to us. From then on, even though we have been uh, scarlet in sin, we become white as snow, pure again. Even though we were dead, we are resurrected, raised up again into newness of life and being. All of this begins when we stop praying to God for something, anything, regardless of what it may be. The very moment that we stop trying to inform God, tell God, influence God, enlighten God. And when we reverse ourselves and take an attitude of, I can of my own self do nothing. I know not how to pray. I know not how to go out or come in. I know not what to ask for. Let thy spirit bear witness with my spirit and make intercession. Speak, Lord. Thy servant hear. There is the secret of prayer. When God speaks to us, we are in prayer. When we are speaking to God, we have separated ourselves from the kingdom of God. When we address God, we are separating ourselves from God's grace. When we learn to be still, be still, be still. And let God come through, we're in prayer, we're in communion. There is a communion then. There's no communion from us to God. God needs no knowledge that we have. God needs no requests from us. And certainly God needs no demands from us. But we need receptivity to God. We need an awareness of God. We need a companionship with God. We need to hear the still small voice because scripture tells us he uttered his voice, and the earth melted. He uttered his voice, and the earth melted. The still, small voice. God isn't in the whirlwind. God isn't in our thinking. God isn't in our pleading and imploring. God isn't even in our praying and sacrificing. That's all part of Jesus' teaching. He tried his best to stop the Hebrews from sacrificing, thinking that they were pleasing God. He tried his best to stop them from praying up to God and to sit and listen to God and go within in the silence in the inner sanctuary, not out there in that magnificent temple, in the secret place, in the inner sanctuary. Close the door where man cannot see you and tabernacle with God, realize God, feel God within yourself. And then you'll have contact with God. And when you have contact with God, you have all there is. Can't you imagine what it's like morning, noon, and night to know that God is here closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, 
and that we can turn within and close the eyes and almost instantly feel a response within, an assurance within, lo, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Before Abraham was, I'm with thee. I will be with thee unto the end of the world. Fear not. If you go through the waters, you will not drown. If the flames kindle upon you, they will not burn. Fear not. I am with you. I will never leave you. As I was with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. So I am with you. Well, when that begins to come into our experience, then you'll know why he said, I am the bread of life. That very I that says, I will never leave you, is also food and inspiration and the waters of life. I can give you waters that bubble up into life everlasting. I can. <clears throat> that I that speaks when we have developed the listening ear. That I that speaks when we have learned to go within in secret, in silence, and realize where God is. God is neither low here nor low there. Not in holy mountains or in temples. The kingdom of God is within you. Well, you see then that none of this is difficult. It is difficult to attain it is difficult to bring to fruition. It isn't difficult to know what the principle of life is. That's just as simple as what I have said to you. But the attaining of it is a little more difficult. Uh -huh. And not too difficult. Otherwise, none of us would ever accomplish it. We accomplish it in uh, this way. First of all, we have scripture to study, not merely to read, because it's been read in churches now ever since the book was first printed 400 years ago. And reading it out of books is of very little value. Pondering it, meditating on individual statements, seeking out the hidden meaning, the inner meaning. This is really the word. This is the bread of life. Through my own experience, I learned that all of this becomes simple if we learn how to meditate. Because meditation enables us to find a quiet place. It can be in a church if there is one handy to us and it's empty enough of people. Or it can be in our home. Any place where four, five, six times a day we can sit down for five or six or seven minutes. Or three minutes will do if there isn't more available at the time. And in those few minutes, go within with some of these Bible passages and then sit quietly for an extra minute and then get up and go about one's work. This repeated four, five, six, seven times in a day or night in a 24-hour period will lead to the experience of thought eventually quieting down and a response coming from within. And when it does, that response is from God. Now, the most wonderful part of uh, all of this is this. You don't have to make your demonstration of harmony or good every day or every week or every month. You only have to make it once in your lifetime. For after you have made your contact with God, it never leaves you nor forsakes you. Then all you have to do is your daily periods of meditation for renewing this communion, renewing this conscious relationship with God. You see, it is literally true 
that from the beginning of time I and my father are one this is your relationship with God you are one with God and you have been one with God ever since the beginning of time before the beginning of time actually before time began now nothing has ever disturbed that relationship you have never been able to commit a sin grave enough to separate you from God because God cannot be separated from himself God is indivisible and that's the only self there is therefore God has never been separated from itself which means from you but just as you may have some money in the bank somewhere and have forgotten it you may own a piece of property somewhere that came to you a generation ago and you may have forgotten it so it is that through our human experience we have lost sight of our oneness with God and there has sprung up in us not a separation from God that cannot be you cannot separate God from yourself any more than you can separate glass from this tumbler glass and this tumbler are one you could break it in a thousand pieces but you couldn't separate glass from tumbler glass and tumbler are one and God and you are one and God and I are one and nothing can break that relationship but we can as we have as human beings they call it in scripture either the prodigal son experience or the Adam and Eve experience makes no difference which uh, symbol you use it means a sense of separation sprung up in your consciousness and whereas before you were in the Garden of Eden one with God heir joint heir to all the heavenly riches in the next breath through a sense of separation which you entertain you're now outside of Eden and you earn your living by the sweat of your brow that's all that has happened to us that's made us humans a sense of separation has sprung up in our consciousness now through our return to the spiritual path we are breaking down that sense of separation and coming into a conscious union with God we are at one with God but now we are coming consciously into the realization of that oneness and that is abiding in the word and letting the word abide in us when we are one with the word we are one with God when we are one with God we are one with the word and uh, to be one we must be consciously one now ye must know the truth ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free and the truth that you must know is your oneness with God you must know the nature of God to know him aright is life eternal and so when you begin to know God is the infinite intelligence of this universe therefore I cannot tell God anything but I can surely learn from God God is the divine love of this universe I need not ask God for anything I need only accept God and in accepting God all these what we call things are added unto us from the moment that this experience comes to us and within ourselves we feel this presence or power or assurance from that moment on our task in life is merely to return to that meditation day after day after day for a little inner communion with God to receive assurance and reassurance of that presence to live move and have our being as if we were dependent on no man whose breath is in his nostril until we can obey scripture cease ye from man 
whose breath is in his nostril, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Put not your faith in princes. When this experience comes to you, you can see quickly, well, I don't need man, I don't need woman, I don't need anything or anybody. I can associate with men and women, I can share with them, giving and taking, but I don't need them. The kingdom of God is within me. I and my father are one. All that the father hath is my son, thou art ever with me. All that I have is thine. Then there's no more seeking from each other. There is only a desire to share with each other. Then you, you want to go out and shout from the housetops what you've learned, and you want to give everybody in the world the feeling of God's presence. And never again do you look to them for anything except love to share with each other, that's all. The secret of life is a simple one. To know him aright is life eternal. To acknowledge him in all thy ways is to experience harmony. To keep the mind stayed on God. To realize that we have no needs Thy grace is my sufficiency. All of these things enables us to understand probably one of the greatest statements that ever came from the mouth of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so every time then that you're tempted to pray for food or clothing or housing or companionship it's so simple to say oh but man shall not live by those things so why waste time praying for them the things we live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God that doesn't mean uh, any word that proceeds out of my mouth that doesn't mean any words that proceed out of your mouth that means every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God and is heard in your ear. Every impartation that comes from God to you, every impulse, every awareness of God that takes place within you, that's the word of God. And when he utters his voice in you, the whole earth of error will melt. Any phase of it, any form of it, and it makes no difference how many years it's been in existence. Even all the years of the locusts. Even that will be overcome. Even the dead shall rise again. No matter how long they've been dead. For the word of God is life eternal. Our function in life is not to pray up to God, but to sit within and let God pray or utter its word within us receptivity receptivity is the greatest word in our language listening for that still small voice listening be still be still don't say and don't think just be still and then a voice will utter itself within us and it'll say turn to the right or turn to the left or go forward and when it does we will obey it keeping the mind filled with spiritual truth is in the last analysis the secret of our demonstration keeping the mind so filled that uh, eventually we make an inner contact that frees us from the things of this world and we enter the new dimension those of you who do not know our work let me tell you please that we do not have any organization we do not have any memberships anywhere on the face of the globe and we never will have There are my writings, which are in book form. And there is my class and lecture work, all of which is recorded. 
And as quickly as I give a class or a lecture in any part of the world, those tapes go all over the rest of the world. And students from one end to the other, students in Africa are listening to classes that took place in England. Students in Australia are listening to classes that took place in New York, and so forth and so on. All around this globe, students are listening to the classwork and the lecture work and even the private work that I give. And uh, they find their inspiration, they find their practice through what they learn in the books and in the recordings. And then I have a monthly letter. And that monthly letter is my direct contact with every student. In that monthly letter, there are principles each month for practice, for remembrance. And then there is also the story of the work as it's going on around the world and as I travel. I know some of you, many of you know already that almost every year I manage to circle the globe in one direction or another. This year, 53,000 miles, something over twice around the globe. Other years have been over 50,000 miles too. And... Uh, in that way, a contact is maintained with the students, and these lessons, lectures, and uh, that enables the student to use whatever my experience is worth for their guidance and for their inspiration, and then uh, set them free to find the kingdom of God within themselves. For there are no ties, there are no bonds, there are no memberships and no dues. Nothing, every individual is free. Every individual has his own copy of the Old Testament or the New Testament. Each one may go to the kingdom of God within themselves in their own home, or if they like, they can go to a church of any denomination that suits their pleasure, or of none. We hold no one in any sense of limitation. Here is the word as it has been given to me from Scripture and from the direct source of inspiration, the many, many spiritual experiences that come to me every week of the year. And they're yours. Those of you who feel a response, they're for you. Those who do not feel a response, they're not for you. That means if you haven't felt a response, that somewhere else is your teacher and your teaching. Keep seeking until you find it. When you have found it, your teaching, forsake all others. And rest with that one that is to become your meat, and your wine, your inspiration, your salvation. In that way, then, you are free to seek and find the realization of God within your own being. And so it is, and so it is. If there are those of you who are not receiving my monthly letter and would like it, I know that if you leave your name and address here before you go, that uh, word will be sent to England. This letter is published in the United States and in England. It's the same letter, but printed in both countries, so that we reach one half of the world over there and the other half of the world over here. And that's all I can tell you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Until we meet again.